The storm it came from across the seven seas. Hold your course, here comes the cavalry. Don't let it get you, don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you, don't let it get you down. Welcome to Humber Valley's online service. My name is Kate Brown. I'm the Director of Inclusion and Engagement, and I want to warmly welcome each of you. No matter who you are, or where you're from, or what you believe, what you've done or left undone, whoever you love, however you identify, you are welcome, you are loved, and you belong here with us. For thousands of years, Indigenous people have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We who are settlers have much to learn from our indigenous siblings. We are gathered on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. This land is home to many diverse indigenous peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Just a couple of announcements that we wanted to put on your radar. Tonight at 7.30, we're continuing our Zoom call with what Trevor meant to say. I'll be hosting that, and it's a time where we can just talk about what we engaged with the teachings, what we learned, what we were inspired by, how it applies to our lives. So that's going to be tonight at 7.30 on Zoom. We also are heading into Holy Week, so we have our Monday, Thursday service, which will be at 7.30 p.m., as well as our Good Friday and Easter Sunday services, both at 10.30 a.m. Finally, we also are offering something called Life After Loss. It's a six-week program for anyone who's suffered a loss in their life, whether it's recent um, or whether it's just any loss, but you're finding um, challenging to figure out the new normal and what life looks like. So it's a six-week program. It starts on Monday nights, April 25th. It's $25, but if that's an impediment for you, um, um, participating, definitely we want to remove that for you. So you can talk to me about this, or you can also talk to Kathy Kitchen. Okay, throwing it over to Drew for more music this morning with our worship together. Hey there, everyone. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Welcome to this digital and sacred space. And I pray grace and peace for you, your family, and your loved ones. 
And before we move deeper into the service, just want all of us to read this prayer together. Join me. Here we go. God of justice, peace, and righteousness, be in our midst this morning. Breathe your breath, your spirit of life, your energy, your imagination on us. Wake us up, open our eyes, open our mouths, and unplug our ears. That we might hear, that we might see, that we might taste, that we might grieve, that we might dream, that we might follow the ways of your extraordinary kingdom. May we find both rest and strength in your eternal love for us. We pray to you, our God, the Creator, Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our breath of life. Amen. Well, let's continue this service by singing together. Here we go. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty so much stronger king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder leaves us breathless all in wonder king of glory king above Take my place. I 
Good morning, my name is Trevor Brisbane. So glad that you found us this morning. If you've been tracking with us this Lent, you know that we've been talking about some big stuff, right? And if this is your first time tuning in, don't worry, we'll work hard to catch you up. We're in this season called Lent. It's the 40 days that leads to the cross of Christ. And more often than not for Christians, Lent has become associated with a sort of like a liturgical or performative suffering. Lent has almost always sort of been reduced to this giving up of carbs or chocolate or Instagram for God. And from the start here at Humber Valley, uh, this year anyway, we've said we want want to impress beyond that. So, So how can we make Lent more than just a sort of performative suffering exercise? But how can it become the site of of empathy and solidarity and advocacy for those who suffer? So we've talked a lot over the last number of weeks about the, the heavy stuff, right? About oppression, about systems of injustice, about protest, and how to resist the dehumanizing forces that are at work in our world. And all these conversations have emerged out of some of the more more familiar passages of the Christian tradition, right? Things, those stories that if you've grown up going to Sunday school, you probably heard a hundred times. Parable of the wedding banquet, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, the parable of the talents, the the passage where Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, when someone strikes you on the, the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And where once we might have heard these passages and these parables as a sort of like nice spiritual lessons, we've been doing some work to reimagine them as events of empathy and resistance and protest and justice. And that really is our big idea this Lent that it's often our privileges, whether those are are racial, like the color of our skin, or social, or gender, or physical, or sexual, or economic, or linguistic privileges, that will always influence what we hear, or maybe what we don't hear in the sacred texts. Because there's never just one way to hear something, right? Like, we've been talking about how there's a duck, but then there's also a rabbit, There's a football, but then for a lot of the world, there's also a football. Our geography, our experience, our culture, where we're situated, will always influence what we hear and how we hear it. And when we hear a Bible passage from a church pew in central Etobicoke, we will probably look for like some sort of spiritual insight or, or like moral takeaway that, that we can take with us through the week. But if you hear a parable from the slums of, say, Nairobi, or the rubble of Ukraine, or a housing project at Jane and Finch, or if you're working at a brothel in Bangkok, maybe you're looking for something different. Right? Maybe, maybe you're desperate to hear a way of liberation and resistance and a way back to find human dignity. This morning, we're going to engage with one of the most famous and cherished stories in the Christian tradition. The story of the prodigal son. And my commitment to you is to work hard to handle this one carefully. So may we have ears to hear beyond our privilege. Wilma, would you read for us from Luke chapter 15? The reading is from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began 
to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to feel it, feed his stomach to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and, you, and I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the catted you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Have you, ever, have you ever longed to hear someone tell you they loved you without condition? That's this parable, isn't it? This parable reads like the divine promise of a God who is always going to be for us. God is this unwavering parent whose affection is always toward us. And no matter how badly we mess up, no matter how far we wander in the wrong direction, divine love welcomes us back. And the incredible thing about this parable is that when the son comes to his father begging and asks for his half of the estate, it's sort of the emotional or relational equivalent to telling his dad, look, dude, you're dead to me. Let's just skip all the formality where you actually have to die. And, and can you just give me what I have coming so I can get on with my life without you, beyond you? How, how does that feel if you're a parent? So the, the kid, the prodigal son, young man, takes the dollars from dad and he heads to, I don't know what, Ibiza or Coachella or Vegas, wherever the kids are going these days. And when the party is over, and when the country he's living in spirals into a disastrous famine, he wakes up one morning to discover that even the pigs are better off than he is. So he, he figures that he'll tuck his proverbial tail between his legs, return to his father's home, and beg for a job. Dad will give me a job. Because even as a household servant, at least then, he'll have food in his stomach. Yet, the story goes, his father sees him, still a long way off, the unmistakable silhouette of his narcissistic son. He runs, the father runs to the son because that's what love does, throws his arms around and embraces his child with a love and forgiveness that is nothing short of divine. 
is this beautiful picture of how God embraces you and each one of us, even with all of our shortcomings and all of our regrets and all those things we don't want anyone else to know about. As we say here at Humber Valley, whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done or perhaps left undone, whomever you love, however you identify, you can belong here. And that's exactly the message of this parent to the child. That's the gospel of God to each one of us. How beautiful is that? This is the God we follow. This is the God we worship. This is the God we gather to learn about this morning. So there's that unconditional love, all-encompassing embrace of grace. But question, is there another way to hear this parable? I I think for most of us, this parable reads like the true happily ever after story. But there is another perspective, right? There is a duck, but there is also a rabbit. And remember, it doesn't change how true and real and beautiful that first reading is. More than one thing can be true at the same time. So so what if this parable isn't just a, a, a happily ever after story? What if it could also be read as a tragedy, a warning, a wake up call? What do I mean by that? Well, this is a story about one family's dynamic, right? And every family has a dynamic. So we know there's at least a dad and there's two sons. And although we don't know too much about them, we know they have means. They're they're rich. Verse 22 tells us, the father said to his servants, like, like there's multiple servants. We know that the father has a fattened calf to butcher for a celebration. He has jewelry and fine robes ready to adorn the son. Even even after half the estate is liquidated and squandered, the prodigal is confident that his dad can afford to bring him back onto the family's payroll. I think it's safe to say, I think the implication here is that it's, it's a pretty wealthy family. This is a story about a family who's got means. The prodigal son goes off to some foreign country where he blows his bank account. We're not told which country he goes to, but listen to the one detail we are given in verses 14 to 16. It says, after he had spent everything, the son, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So so the country is in this severe famine, severe famine, to the point where even pig food looks like a reasonable dietary option. And why won't people share their pig pods with the prodigal? Well, maybe it's because he stands out as a foreigner and and they don't like foreigners. But I suspect it's because the famine is so severe. They are eating, everyone's eating the pig pods of themselves. Or it's like their only option to keep the pigs alive, which will then eventually feed the families down the road. Like, Whatever country this is, the one detail we're given about it, the one thing we need to know is that the situation is dire. This famine is for real. We also know that the the situation gets really bad. The prodigal has a backup plan. He's got a safety net. He's got a, a plan B. He can return home to where he came from. He's got a way out. And this is where I propose things turn tragic. Because while all of us are consumed with the narrator's telling of the father relating to the prodigal and, and, and how the second brother relates to the father and what the embrace was like and who was wearing which robe and what was for dinner, we're only seven verses away from there was a severe famine in the whole country. 
We're only six verses away from there was so much hunger and desperation, people weren't sharing their pig pods. And look, like, I love a good family reunion as much as anyone. But here, as the steaks are being marinated, as the robes are being ironed, and as rings are being polished in this family, there's still an entire country of people starving. Is it not tragic that the prodigal son didn't even mention the famine to his dad? Doesn't even come up. Like, why was the first thing out of his mouth not, Dad, I'm so sorry. Thank you, thank you for receiving me home. Dad, I missed you. But listen, it's tragic. So I used a bunch of women back there, and I was a total jerk. But now it's really bad. Some of these women are probably starving. Can can we hold off on on this feast and the celebration to help them and their families? How quickly we can become so enamored in the success of the wealthy that we ignore the utter horror of the majority. Have you ever noticed that, that Now the precious son is back. Not a single word is wasted on that famine. And everyone in the family resumes the rhythm of wealth and privilege and eliteness. Because when you exist in the privileged space, how quickly we want to normalize it and justify it and remain comfortable within it. What if the truly shocking part of this parable is not only the incredible forgiveness of the Father, but also the incredible indifference of the prodigal toward a starving country? It's it's as though he's learned nothing, right? It's as though now that his tummy is full and his clothes are clean, he will pick up where he left off, ready to use his father and his family's servants, just like he used the hungry women in the unnamed country. I mean, ultimately, what is the story of Christianity about? It's about how one man surrenders all privilege, even divine privilege, for the sake of the many. Philippians 2 tells us, For Christ did not consider equality with God something to cling to, something to grasp, something to hold tightly to, but he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant. This this prodigal story reads of one man forsaking the many in order to cling to any bit of wealth and privilege he can recover. It's It's like the opposite of the Jesus story. I wonder if the question being asked of us in this story could be, where's my comfort and my privilege? allowed me to cling to indifference and to remain willfully distant to the suffering, injustice, and disparity that is all around me. And and the Father, I mean, the Father is kind of an enabler in this, is he not? There's a version of the story where the Father really frustrates me. I mean, I love his no questions Ask kind of forgiveness. Like, that's a great approach. But by not asking any questions, is the prodigal any closer to compassion and empathy? Like, uh, uh, I'm all for forgiveness, but that doesn't mean the hard questions don't need to be asked. Will launching my son right back into the same life of privilege and entitlement make him a better person? Does it, does it make the world a better place? Has my son changed? Can he handle the responsibility that comes with privilege and power? I appreciate how good it must have been to have his kid back, but it still seems like a bit of a parenting gap to me. I think think hard questions need to accompany good forgiveness. Like, why did indigenous children end up in residential schools, all of which were sponsored by churches? Have have we learned all that needed 
to be learned from that? Like, like have we really done all the work to examine where racism and bias is, is alive and well in the church? Why, why was the Christian church silent in the rise of Nazi Germany? What's changed since then? Why do so many white evangelicals support the trucker fiasco and Donald Trump and Christian nationalism, even here in Canada? Why do powerful men keep getting away with violence, even when the whole world is just trying to watch a, a fun award show? What are churches doing about sexual abuse, misogyny, and locker room talk. Like, if we're not willing to ask the hard questions, very easily we become complicit enablers. As it was, as it was once put, when I feed the poor, they called me a saint. When I asked why the poor were amongst us, they called me a communist. This father, I mean, I love his heart. Like, you can, you can tell how well-intentioned and, and how much love he has for a kid. But he is enabling an environment that rewards the prodigal's self-absorbed indifference. And it seems like he's shortcutting any real change or transformation that could happen in this young man's life. It feels a bit like, I don't know, maybe meeting up with friends to discuss the evils of globalization and capitalist greed at Starbucks. Or, or it's a bit like driving to a climate change rally in your Hummer. You can feel like you're being nice, you can feel like you're doing the right thing, but you're ultimately the instigating source for the problem. And if, if the prodigal is only thinking about those women when he wants something from them, if he's only repentant because he's hungry, will enveloping him back into the same opulence lead the world any closer to the kingdom of God? And, and that other brother, like, can we just talk about him for a second? Can we, can we call him out a little bit here as, as envy? He's the one that complains to his dad, you, you never gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friend's dad. How come he gets more than me? How come I don't have what he has? I, I have everything, but how come he has more of everything? Right? That's called envy. It seems like in this beloved story, if you read it carefully, there is an unholy trinity at work here. The indifference of the son, the enabling of the father, and the envy of the brother. Indifference, enabling, and envy. So what if the story of the prodigal son is more than just a happily ever after story? What if it can also be a story about the devastation and destruction that is left in the wake when our religion is reduced to spiritual sentimentality? If we allow the story of the prodigal to just be another nice spiritual lesson. I mean, it, it feels like we're reducing God to an emotional sugar daddy who would rather provide us with comfort and wealth rather than lead us toward a radical love, confronting the forces that leave this world spiritually, emotionally, economically, ecologically famished. What if more than just a Sunday school theology lesson, this parable is a neon flashing light warning every single one of us who dares to admit that we are privileged. M you know, may maybe we aren't disadvantaged because of the color of our skin or the language or accent with which we speak or the neighborhood where we were born. It's, 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 the, the warning of how insular we can become if we're not careful. That we too can run from the hungry and the forgotten for the sake of our own comfortable appetites. 
for a world where one feasts on divine forgiveness while another dies of devastating famine? is in a world that needs just a nice spiritual lesson. It's a world which needs an uprising of love and a revolution of justice. So what if the genius of this parable is that when we combine both the readings, is that it's never too late for us to turn Whether we are the ones who have lived in different and enabling, justifying our own status quo, it's never too late to embrace the divine vision of justice and equality and sustainability and reconciliation and compassion. Because it is 100% theologically true that God doesn't hold our sin against us. And so now, from a place of acceptance and love, the divine points us back to the people and the places that are starving for even the smallest scrap of mercy and hope. Where is my privilege? Where is my spirituality? Where has my version of Christianity prevented me from seeing the people I need to speak up for? the people I need to advocate for, and the people I need to engage with. For this, this might be more than just a story about forgiveness. What if it's a story of what we are called to give ourselves for? Humber Valley, may we, like the prodigal, turn toward the divine embrace May you feel your heavenly parent who holds you with nothing but pure love. And may you transcend the prodigal, choosing love and action rather than indifference. And may you know the divine embrace, which is like a a, a forgiving parent full of tenderness and unconditional love. And may you transcend the father, daring to break religion that enables the status quo. For perhaps this reading is true Christianity. Before we sing our next song, I invite you to pray this prayer confession with me. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Oh God, how I need you. 
support the life and ministry of Humber Valley United Church, you can do so online at hvuc.ca or by sending a check into the church. And we are so thankful for you partnering with us. Please join me as we close in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The storm it came from across the seven seas. Hold your course, here comes the cavalry. Don't let it get you down, let it get you down Don't let it get you, don't let it get you down One, two, three, four